I'll turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We'll, we'll uh, leave chapter 1 today and uh, move on to chapter 2 next week. But here we are in chapter 1. We're going to read verses 8 through 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Would you stand with me as we honor God's Word? The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn, from God to, uh, fr- turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Thank you. You may be seated. A few years ago, there was a very zealous, young, soul-winning preacher who was driving through the countryside, and he saw a farmer there on the side of the road mending a fence. And so he slowed down to a stop, and he was concerned about that farmer's soul. So he pulled over, and he asked the man, Are you laboring in the vineyard of the Lord, my my good man? And he didn't even look up. The the farmer just continued his work and he said, No, these are soybeans. Preacher said, You don't understand. I'm asking if you're a Christian. The farmer still didn't look up. He just kept focusing on his work and he said, Nope, my name is Jones. You must be looking for Jim Christian. He lives about a mile south of here. But the young preacher was determined, so he tried again. He said, are you lost? And the farmer said, no, I've lived here all my life. Well, by this time, the preacher was frustrated, and so he finally asked, are you prepared for the rapture? It's coming soon. Now, this caught the farmer's attention, and he stopped. He pulled out his handkerchief from his back pocket and wiped his brow and he said oh when's it going to be well he thought he had accomplished something so the young preacher replied well it could be today it could be tomorrow it could be the next day well the farmer wiped his brow one more time put his handkerchief back in his back pocket and he said well please don't mention it to my wife she don't get out much If she hears about it, she'll want to go all three days. Well, as the young preacher said, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, or it could be the next day. Or it might be ten years from now, but he is coming back one day. So we shouldn't just twiddle our thumbs and go about our business as usual. There are certain things that we should be doing in the meantime. We're looking at some specific verbs in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Verbs which point us to what we should be doing as we wait for Christ to return. We're taking them up in the order in which they appear in the letter and not in any particular place of importance. So we've seen so far that in the meantime, we should pray and we should witness. Today we include two verbs because they are located so closely together in verses 9 and 10, and because they are naturally linked together. In fact, we're going to see that even though Paul uses two different verbs, he's actually talking about one action on our part. So what's next? What should we be doing? In verse 9, first, we should turn to serve. Turn to serve. Now, Jesus came into their lives and he changed them. People for several hundred miles around were talking about it. Christ had made a big difference, so much so that Paul said they turned from idols. Now, the word that Paul used for turn has the idea of twisting something so that it is pointed in a different direction. Paul was pointing out that that the things they used to turn to were suddenly emptied of all power. They had no more meaning for them, and they turned away from them and turned to the Lord. Now let's remember, Thessalonica, where these people lived, 
was an important city. It was the Roman capital of the province of Macedonia. Most likely the idols there were Roman and Greek and Egyptian, or maybe a, a mixture of them. The Roman Caesar was worshipped as a god. There were Zeus and Dionysius and Osiris and Apollos and Aphrodite, among others. You've heard of some of those. Each of them revered for certain reasons and worshipped in a particular way. They were a very religious people. The city was a very religious city, but all their gods were false idols. Now for them to turn from, those, from serving those idols was a much bigger deal than we may realize. Their entire culture was immersed in, the, in exciting festivals, cleansing rites, prophecies that supposedly came from these idols. They were completely surrounded by the worship of these false gods. For them to turn away from them was so revolutionary that they would follow Christ only if they were ready for a full commitment. Following Jesus and nothing else. Well, somebody might say, well, you know, that was then, but that's not a problem for us. Which should prompt us to ask what idols we do need to turn from. To answer that question, we should define what an idol is. An idol for us today would be anything or anyone between us and God. Anything or anyone between us and God. Perhaps a, a mental image might help. Imagine yourself on one side of a large field. And on the other side, directly across, a long way across over there, is the throne of God. Between you and God, there are all kinds of things that you've picked up along in, in your life. Just, just living, you've picked up a few things, and they're all scattered out there in that field. Some of them you can hold in your hands. Some of them are held in the heart. Perhaps most of them are held in the heart. Now look out across that field, and what is it that you see? Perhaps just a few feet away there is a vehicle. It's between you and God, and you realize that's not how you want to live, so you take a few steps and, and you put that car or that truck or that boat behind you. Well, beyond that is an addiction of some sort. Or maybe a relationship with someone you just assume nobody else knew about. So you take that matter before the Lord and you confess it and you put that one behind you too. A little further across the field, you run across something that happened between you and another person years ago that left you angry and maybe even bitter and unforgiving. And you refuse to let it go. The wound never completely heals. This one is perhaps more difficult to deal with than what you've seen so far, but after wrestling with it, it too is behind you, and you are that much closer to God. But then you almost stumble ac across a trophy shelf full of accomplishments and success. And you stand there looking at this trophy shelf, and you see the throne of God still in the distance and you realize that all those things are worthless even if you were real proud of them at the time they're worthless compared to knowing Christ and so you walk past them money is the next thing even if you don't have a lot of it but with a jolt you realize that not even all the money in the world can buy for you a relationship with your heavenly father that you crave that you long for that you desire well you're strolling along now a little relieved that those issues have have been put behind you you're closer to the lord than you've been in a long time and you look forward to being able to be in his presence once again in unbroken fellowship but you glance down to watch your steps just to make sure you don't stumble and you 
you almost tumble into a deep pit, so deep and dark, you can't see the bottom of it. And in that hole is a disgusting, putrid, stinking heap of all sorts of things, such as laziness and lies and lust and doubt, a sense of unworthiness. There's racism. There's fear. There's hopelessness. There's the pain of rejection. There's a judgmental attitude toward other people who don't think the same way you do or act the same way you do. Or maybe they don't dress as nicely as you do. Maybe that attitude has you thinking that you're better than everybody else and you know all the answers. And covering all of that is a tarp or like a tarp is guilt. Things you've forgotten about. And there they are. All those things in that pit. All those things that have been in your life for so long that in a perverse sort of way they might even bring a little bit of comfort just knowing they're there. Why can't you let those things go? Well, let's pull up and stop right there. What still stands between you and God? Whatever is there, that is an idol. An idol, anything that comes between us and God and occupies a place of meaning and fulfillment that it can never possibly give. It might be home. It might even be family. It could be something from our past. It could be a dream that we still have for our future. It literally could be anything. But whatever it is, if it is closer to us than God is, it is an idol. Paul said they had turned from idols to serve the living God. And everybody was talking about it. Now listen, any so-called conversion isn't worth much at all if we're not noticeably changed as a result. You can talk all you want to about loving Jesus and being the Christian and doing all of these wonderful things, but if your life has not been changed so that people talk about it, so that people notice like they did it uh, for these people, that's a good reason to question it. One Bible scholar wrote this, we need to look like what we're talking about. We need to look like what we're talking about. Here are familiar words from God Himself. <clears throat> Recorded in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, He said, then He would hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There's an old word that is used to describe this turning from our wicked ways. It's called repentance. Repentance. The word repent has been called the first word of the gospel. And here's why. When John the Baptist came... Repentance was his message. Here's what he preached. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus began to preach, his message was, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. When Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, they, the scripture says in Mark 6, they went out and preached that people should repent. Repent is what the wayward son did to be restored to his father in that famous parable that Jesus told. Repentance 
was the message of Peter on the day of Pentecost when he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. It was Paul's message, and we see it in several of his letters. Remember that in the book of Revelation, there are seven letters that John was to write to churches, seven different churches. Five of those seven churches were told to repent. In fact, ten times in the book of Revelation, we see the words repent or repentance, and we see them 50 times in the, in the New Testament. But to press this point even further, when we read in the book of Hebrews, we learn that repentance is one of the elementary doctrines of Christ. Repentance is the foundation. It is where we start. And we may think that repentance is a temporary turning away from sin. That we feel sorry for what we've done and we apologize to God. But the biblical idea of repentance is that one has such a complete, total inner change that it has a direct effect on the way he lives. He is radically transformed. He turns away from anything that would come between him and God. A person who has turned away from idols will never again excuse an action or a or a a speech pattern or anything else they do by saying, well, that's just the way I am. No, that the way you are has become an idol and you need to turn from it. Excuses that we, that we make to wipe away any sin that we have. Those are idols. They had turned away. That's what Paul said. You you have turned from those things and you serve the living God. That's what happened to them. It should happen to us as we wait for Christ to come back. The old Southern Baptist evangelist Vance Havner once talked about trying to convert people to Christ without repentance. He said, there is a trend today that would put a new robe on the prodigal son while he's still feeding hogs. Now, get that image in your head. There's a trend today that would put a new robe on a prodigal son while he's still feeding hogs. And then he said, some would put the ring on his finger while he's still in the pigsty. Others would paint the pigsty and advocate bigger and better hog pens. Boy, he had a way with words, didn't he? Repentance does not just paint the pigsty. Repentance totally changes the person from the inside out. In fact, Martin Luther, whose actions helped kick off the Protestant Reformation many, many years ago, said this, to do so no more is the truest repentance. To do so no more is the truest repentance. Now, imagine that you're on your hands and knees working in your flower bed. You're trying to get rid of the weeds. But their roots go down deeply into the soil. Sometimes they come out very easily. Other times you pull on a weed and It breaks off at the surface. There are times in our lives when we deal with the idols that have come between us and the Lord, but when we reach inward to yank yank them out, we find out the roots go down too deeply into our spirits for us to deal with them so quickly. Some of them may require digging a little bit. They may require some serious soul searching, some serious repentance, even if we have been followers of Christ for many years. Several years ago, a man by the name of Robert Stapp, Robert Stapp, wrote in the Rocky Mountain News in Denver, Colorado. If your account with a credit card company gets messed up, do not attempt to unsnarl it. It's simpler just to move away and start a new life under an assumed name. Well, that may be true. But you cannot move away and begin again under an assumed name 
when things in your relationship with God get messed up. Because God knows where you are. You can change your name and move wherever you want to, but God knows who you are and where you are. The situation is not hopeless, but it does require repentance. Now, do not, do not get the idea that because I'm in front of you talking about repentance, that I don't need to repent of my sin. I need to repent of my sin. You need to repent of your sin. All God's children need to repent of their sin. All of our minds need to be changed in regard to how we conduct ourselves and how we think. God said, if my people were all guilty of sin that needs to be turned from, and so much the more when we consider that we are one day closer to the return of Christ than we were yesterday. We need to turn to serve. But then in verse 10, we see we should wait for the Son. Now, I want you to notice something. Paul has just told them that they had turned from idols to serve the living God. In our way of thinking, anytime we talk about serving, we have in our minds the image of action, the image of doing something, of being busy. But that's not what we see in verse 10. Paul says they're waiting for the Son of God to come from heaven. Now, the way he phrased this, it sounds as though he's talking about two different things. One, turning to serve, and two, waiting for his return. He does, in fact, use the word and at the beginning of verse 10, but and is not to separate them, it's to tie them together. And so he does so in the same sentence. Turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. It's similar to our, our um, saying that the act of breathing includes inhaling and exhaling. If you only inhale, you're not breathing. If you only exhale, you're not breathing. It. You have to do both of them to say that you're breathing. Well, Paul sees these two verbs turn and wait as part of the same action turning from dead idols to serve the living God and waiting for the sun from heaven G. Campbell Morgan was a British evangelist and pastor and he once said this I never begin my work in the morning without thinking that perhaps he may interrupt my work and begin his own and then he hastened to add this, I'm not looking for death, I'm looking for him. Morgan was waiting for Christ, even while he was working. Dwight Moody used to say, I never preach a sermon without thinking that possibly the Lord may come before I preach another. Boy, that's a sobering thought. I never preach a sermon without thinking that possibly the Lord may come before I preach another. Moody was waiting, even while he was working. Well, dig deeper. The word that Paul used for waiting indicates continuous action. They were always on the lookout for Christ's return. It implies that they were eagerly anticipating that coming great event. Looking and waiting was habitual for them. I'm, I just mentioned Dwight Moody... He founded uh, a Bible school in Chicago many years ago. By the, it still exists. Uh, Moody Bible Institute. Moody Bible Institute. And a few years ago, the president was named Joseph Stowell. And Dr. Stowell was visiting a home for children who were mentally disabled. And as, as they were touring the facility, he noticed that many of the windows were covered with tiny little handprints just all over them. And he turned to the director and he asked, 
what are all those handprints about on the windows? And the director kind of chuckled and he said, the children here love Jesus and they're so eager for him to return that they lean against the windows as they look up to the sky. Oh, they were waiting to have that kind of faith, to have that kind of expectancy. I want to ask you this. Do your windows have any handprints on them? Are you looking and waiting and watching and working for the return of Christ? When we turn from anything that occupies a spot between us and the Lord, when we get serious about our devotion to Christ and what we truly believe in these days before He comes back, other people are going to sit up and take notice. We become people who turn from idols, idols of our own making. Idols, perhaps, whose roots have gone down so deeply into our hearts we don't even realize they're there until we get serious with the Lord and ask Him to root out anything that shouldn't be there, to remove anything between us and Him. Is there anything still between you and the Lord? Any weeds that need pulled up? Anything, anyone, let us turn and wait. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you now to thank you, Lord, for your great love and your great mercy. This grace that has been bestowed on us we don't deserve it. We don't deserve your love. We don't deserve an opportunity to repent of our sins. But you love us that much. Father, I pray that the windows of our souls might be covered with handprints. That we're constantly looking for Christ to come back. But Lord, in the meantime, since we don't know when that time will be. Impress on our hearts, Lord, the importance of getting rid of anything between us and You, of turning from those things to serve You and follow You as we wait for Christ. And Father, if there's somebody here who needs to turn from, from, from a, a dead life for the first time to follow the life of Christ, someone who needs to make Christ Lord and Savior of their lives, Father, give them the courage to say so, to look down deep inside of their hearts and admit to themselves and to you that they need Jesus. Lord, the rest of us have been following you for maybe a long time. Give us also the courage to admit that there yet still may be something between us and you that we've not dealt with, something we've not eradicated, something we've not sought forgiveness for. Help us to be honest as we look at our lives, as we look at that field of our lives, as we look down to that pit, we don't want to live like that. We want to be close to you, Lord, and we don't want anything to come between us and you. Lord, give us the courage to say, Father, I repent. I turn from those things to follow Christ. Lord, thank you for hearing us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.